Hello, everybody. Um, thank you to Jibril for that opening and Hani for all the work to organize this event and all the other um, students for making the time to make this happen. Uh, it's really an honor to be at Rutgers at Newark. I think I told some of you that one of my first cases when I was at the Center for Constitutional Rights, um, which Professor Stevens has worked with for many years and for, uh, before that was actually looking at uh, issues of NYPD police surveillance of Muslim communities in the Newark area. I was the most junior lawyer in that case. So, you know, being here and being with probably many of you who come from the communities in the nearby area is really an honor. I wish it was under... Um, different circumstances than what we're seeing uh, today uh, on the ground in Israel-Palestine. Um, but I do look forward to having the chance to talk with you and discuss these issues today. So what I want to try and do in my remarks, Hanny told me to try and stick to about 45 minutes, is to spend maybe the first half of that time, about 20 to 25 minutes, to talk through the situation we see on the ground today. And as much as I can, knowing that many of you or most of you are law students, to connect the facts that you might be aware about on the ground with the law and our analysis of um, the violations taking place um, on the ground. And then I want to spend the second half of my talk, the last 20, 25 minutes, talking about international courts in Palestine. What's happening at the International Criminal Court? What's happening at the International Court of Justice? Where do things stand? What might we expect ahead? What are the challenges? What are the obstacles? And I look forward with uh, Professor Stevens and with all of you to uh, a discussion on these issues. Let me start. Um, and again, Jabril, I think, started us off in the right place by saying that we are facing a level of bloodshed and repression that's unprecedented in the modern history of Israel-Palestine. Um, we've simply never seen uh, the kinds of atrocities that we're seeing today. But I want to be clear. What's unprecedented is the scale of those atrocities, not the kind, because many of these abuses we've been seeing, documenting, speaking out on for years and for decades. And it's precisely the impunity for those grave abuses that produce the unspeakable atrocities that we're seeing on the ground today. So I do want to talk about the reality post-October 7th, but I actually want to spend more of my time talking about what the reality was like on October 6th. Because I think that doesn't get enough of the conversation, but without understanding what the reality looked like on October 6th, it's difficult to process what we've seen over the last, uh, what, 145, 135, I, I've honestly lost a, a count of days since October 7th. So let's start there. Gaza is a part of the occupied Palestinian territory. As a legal matter, Gaza is part of a single territorial entity as the West Bank. So you should be able to move between Gaza and the West Bank the way you move beyond, between, I don't know, Newark and New York City, mm -hmm. right? Um, more than just that, since 1967, Gaza has been under Israeli occupation, which means it is under international humanitarian law as well as international human rights law. Now, this is a really critical point. The Israeli government claims in 2005 it withdrew its ground forces, it's withdrew its settler population. It claims that basically it's disclaimed itself of its responsibilities in Gaza and it's dealing with a sovereign independent entity. That is false. Israel since 2005 has maintained control over the movement of people and goods. We can talk about Egypt and Rafah later in the presentation. It controls um, the, the airspace, the access to the sea. It controls the infrastructure that Gaza relies upon. So that's electricity, internet, water. I mean, we've seen all of this since October 7th. It controls the access to natural resources. It controls the population registry that is responsible for issuing Palestinian ID cards that you need to move. So virtually all aspects of fundamental everyday life remain under the control of the Israeli government. Since 2007, the Israeli government has imposed a generalized closure, a closure of Gaza. What that means is there is a policy that there's a generalized ban on movement. This is before October 7th. Nobody in, nobody out, unless you fall within a narrow band of humanitarian exemptions. Now, I want to make this point clear. This is not a security-based policy factually. This is a generalized ban. So even if somebody somehow, let's say, qualifies to leave Gaza to take a life-saving procedure in Jerusalem, if that same person one week later wants to travel for a work conference or, God forbid, to go on 
vacation, they're forbidden from doing so, not because Israel's determined them to be a threat, but because their policy is nobody in, nobody out, unless you fit within those humanitarian exemptions. Um, that's not just a policy about movement of people. It also applies to the movement of goods. There is sweeping restrictions on the movement into and out of Gaza, exports and imports of goods, even to the occupied West Bank, which is part of that same territory. As a result, before October 7th, 80% of Gaza's population relied on humanitarian aid, and the majority of people spent about half the day without electricity, okay? So 16 years of closure, right? And, and that has persisted since 2007. 57 years of occupation, right? And that's an occupation characterized by systematic human rights abuses, not just the closure, not just the killings, um, but the, the kind of regular everyday repression that Palestinians in Gaza face, even for example, in 2018, 2019, when they went to protests against the closure, against the denial of their right of return on the fences separating Gaza and Israel, and they were gunned down, scores of Palestinians killed for protesting. In addition, the majority of Gaza's population are themselves refugees who were expelled or forced to flee their homes in 1948 in the events that led to the creation of the Israeli state that Palestinians refer to as the Nekma. Okay, so on October 6th, you had 75 years for the majority of the population as refugees, 56, 57 years of occupation, 16 years of basically treating Gaza like an open air prison. Okay, but that's not even the end of it. So as Penny mentioned in my introduction, Human Rights Watch in 2021 released a report. That report looked systematically how the Israeli government treats Palestinians. So we did a, a two years, we did case studies across the occupied Palestinian territory in Israel proper, comparing the treatment of Palestinian communities with um, Jewish Israeli communities, Gaza, West Bank, East Jerusalem, Israel proper. We looked at 30 years of Human Rights Watch's research. We compiled the trends. We looked at the data. We looked at the work of our partners. We looked at statements and justifications by the Knesset, by the Israeli government. We documented in methodical detail how Israel treats Palestinians. <clears throat> Once we did so, we then applied the law. Okay, so again, for those who are not lawyers in the room or haven't taken human rights law, there is a prohibition under international law against severe discriminatory repression. The term, the legal term, is apartheid. So while that term was coined in relation to specific events in Southern Africa, international treaties, including the International Covenant on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, define apartheid as a universal legal term. Indeed, the prohibition against apartheid has the status of a use Kogan's norm. It is the highest level of prohibition <clears throat> under international law. In addition, apartheid is a crime against humanity, set out not only in its own convention, <clears throat> ratified by dozens of states from the 1970s, but it is one of the 11 crimes against humanity set out under the Rome Statute to the International Criminal Court. Again, for the non-lawyers in the room, for those or those, you know, one else who just finished crim law or whatever, you'll know that crimes generally have core elements. In the case of apartheid, it's no different. There's usually an act and an intent, a mental state, and there's a context. With apartheid, you have those three elements. So the intent <clears throat> requirement is an intent to maintain a regime of domination by one group of people, one racial group of people over another. The act requirement are what is known as inhumane acts, which are particularly severe abuses, um, <clears throat> things like forcible transfer, mass land expropriation, et cetera. And the third requirement is the context. And that context is systematic oppression by one group of people, one racial group of people over another. Right? So intent to dominate, systematic oppression, inhumane acts. So when Human Rights Watch applied the facts that we documented pursuant to the methodology I laid out to this legal framework, we determined that Israeli authorities are committing the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution against Palestinians, including the Palestinians of Gaza. Very briefly, I, you know, I do hold talks on this, but <clears throat> the short version of how we reached that conclusion was as follows. First, we found that the Israeli government 
has pursued a policy to maintain the domination by Jewish Israelis over Palestinians in the area between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, Israel and Palestine. That's primarily done through a desire to, to maintain control over demographics and land for the benefit of Jewish Israelis to the detriment of Palestinians. So to follow a simple maxim, maximum land, minimum Palestinians, right? So demographics, there are many, many examples of the policy. They include, for example, a 2003 law, which has been on the books pretty much for the 20 years since, which forbids the granting of long-term legal status to Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza married to Israeli citizens or nationals. So in essence, Simplistically, Israelis can marry people from virtually any country around the world, give them legal status to live with them, but not if you're a Palestinian from the West Bank or Gaza. Now, the Israeli government formally said this was a security-driven policy, but our report lays out statements, policy documents showing that the real purpose, and it's obvious to anybody that spends five seconds looking at the law, is maintaining demographic control. There are many, many other examples of this policy, including the fact that Palestinian refugees, who number 5.9 million, are denied the right to return to their homes that they're from for generations and their descendants, while a Jewish American or a, a British, a Jewish Brit could move tomorrow to Israel and automatically become a citizenship. Again, a policy that no one hides behind. It's demogra demographically driven. Okay. In addition, land. In the Negev and the Galilee, these are regions that make up two-thirds of Israel proper. There is a formal government policy across political parties to Judaize these areas. <clears throat> these aren't just words on paper. There are laws that back it up. For example, in the, the Galilee and in the uh, Negev, there are laws that allow small towns and villages to have admissions committees who approve who lives there. And according to one professor at Haifa University, there are 900 small Jewish towns and villages that have zero Palestinians living in them because these admissions committees screen them out. Many, many other examples. In Jerusalem, which includes occupied East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem, the government policy, it's quoted in our report, is to maximize um, <clears throat> the number of Jewish Israelis in the municipality. They even set target demographic ratios. It was ideally 70-30. They readjusted to 60-40 based on term. And there are policies to back that up. Similarly, in the West Bank, very explicit decades of government policy documents saying that the goal is to grow the settlements and confine Palestinians to enclaves. Gaza fits in this paradigm as well. The Palestinian Human Rights Organization and Mizan released a report in 2021 called uh, uh, the Gaza Bantistan, where they explain, in essence, how Gaza fits into the apartheid framework. And the way to understand it, the way I would explain to an American audience is, in essence, to understand the withdrawal. This is based on statements from Israeli government officials, as well as our research of how Israel has implemented the, their policies since their withdrawal from Gaza in 2005. Mm -hmm. The way to understand us as an act of gerrymandering, right? They took 9,000 Jewish settlers out of a 25 by 7 mile territory that today has 2.3 million Palestinians to consolidate their demographic control over the rest of Israel and Palestine that they hope to retain. With Gaza, the demographic balance is about 50-50, Jewish, Israeli, and Palestinian between the river and the sea. Without Gaza, it's about 60-40. One last point on the intent to dominate, and I realize I'm giving a longer version of the apartheid argument, but I think it's important to understand, which is <clears throat> Israel justifies many of their policies as about security. But many of the things I just laid out, 2003 law, um, the denial of building permits to Palestinians, the land expropriation, taking land from Palestinians for Jewish Israelis, have no legitimate serious security justification for them. There's no security reason why you give permits to settlers, but you don't give it to Palestinians. But even where security is a consideration, like the policy towards Gaza, right? The Israeli government has gone so far beyond what international law justifies that security no more justifies apartheid as it would justify torture or unlawful killing or other abuses undertaken in the name of security. Okay, so intent to dominate, check. Right, we have intent to dominate. <clears throat> Systematic oppression, Human Rights Watch concluded between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, the Israeli government um, systematically oppresses Palestinians. You have basically a two tiered system. If I were to describe the reality of Israel Palestine to a nine year old, I always say I would tell them three sentences. There are two groups of roughly equal size 
that live in the area between the river and the sea. The government privileges one, oppresses the other. That's kind of it. And that simplistic rendition of the facts, I think, has often been um, overlooked because it's the way we compartmentalize and fragment the situation. But in the West Bank, you have, system, you have two different legal regimes, Palestinians and Jewish Israelis who might live across the street. I'm here talking about the 2.7 million uh, Palestinians in the West Bank. Let's put East Jerusalem aside and the 500,000 <clears throat> Jewish Israelis living in settlements governed under different legal systems. Civil law, Israeli civil law for the settlers, military law for the Palestinians. So if people who live across the street, and I think I, I you know, I lived there for several years, in some cases they live across the street. <clears throat> they commit the same offense. They throw rocks. They're tried in different courts. They have different due process rights. Or to be more exact, Jewish Israelis have due process and Palestinians do not. And they get different sentences for the very same offense. And it's not just about two regimes. There's also enforced segregation in the West Bank. Palestinians cannot enter settlements except as laborers bearing special permits. In addition to all of that, you have the fact that the land and the resources have been expropriated from Palestinians for settlements. And settlements are war crimes. They're violations of the Fourth Geneva Convention, the transfer of one's civilian population, territory acquired by war. Similar dynamics in East Jerusalem. To give you an example, if a Jewish Israeli Jerusalemite comes to study at Rutgers and a Palestinian Jerusalemite comes to study at Rutgers, the Palestinian, by the way, is stateless, um, even though they might go back 2,000 years from Jerusalem. They only have residency status. The Jewish Israeli is a citizen. The Jewish Israeli can go back to Jerusalem knowing that their legal status is 100% secure. But the Palestinian status is not. They could lose their legal right to reside in the country they're from. Because um, if they don't, if the Israeli government determines they don't maintain a con connection to uh, Jerusalem, Gaza, I don't think I need to explain to this audience the systematic oppression of Palestinians in Gaza. We'll get to that later if you're not uh, sure of it. And then even within Israel proper, to give you one example, in the Negev or the Nakba, there are 35 Palestinian Bedouin communities, about 90,000 residents, which are not recognized by the Israeli government. They receive no services, their homes get demolished. Um, uh, they're basically unlawful in their very own homes. And this is within Israel's own border. And some a kilometer or two away from Jewish Israeli communities. Systematic oppression, check, right? The final element of the crime is inhumane acts. And Human Rights Watch concluded that there are five clusters of inhumane acts that the Israeli government has taken against Palestinians. There, there might be many, many others. This wasn't meant to be an exhaustive list, but these are the five we focused on. One is the movement restrictions. I already mentioned the closure of Gaza, but even in the West Bank, before October 7th, more than 600 checkpoints and other closure obstacles that can turn a routine commute to school, to work, into an hours-long humiliating ordeal. Palestinians in the West Bank also need permits to enter parts of the West Bank. So probably while many of you in the audience could, I mean, by most of you, except the Palestinians and maybe me, could get on a plane and fly to Ben Gurion Airport, and go to East Jerusalem and enter the old city. A Palestinian who might live three kilometers away on the other side of the wall can't do it without a very difficult to obtain permit. Plus, you have the separation barrier largely built on Palestinian land, which the International Court of Justice 20 years ago said was unlawful. <clears throat> the movement restrictions are an inhumane act. Second inhumane act we document is the land expropriation. One third of the West Bank, one third of East Jerusalem, through a variety of different legal tools, which are explained in our report, have been expropriated from Palestinians and given to settlements which are unlawful. They reduced the West Bank to 165 disconnected territorial islands, in essence. Fantasies, enclaves, whatever term you prefer. The land expropriation is an inhumane act. Third, <clears throat> inhumane act, forcible transfer. It is virtually impossible for a Palestinian to get a building permit in the majority of the West Bank under Israel's exclusive control, as well as in East Jerusalem. Between 2016 and 2018, according to Israeli government data, the Israeli government issued 100x, 100 times more demolition orders than building permits for Palestinians in the majority of the West Bank under its exclusive control, known as Area C, while settlements continue to grow every year, it seems, at more and more of a rate. So what happens? Palestinians get married. They have children, they want to build, 
They build, their homes get demolished. Every year, the Israeli government raises hundreds of Palestinian homes, businesses, and schools. The coercive policies amount to forcible transfer. They force Palestinians out of their homes. That's home demolitions only allowed in occupied territory for exigent military reasons. Not having a permit when you don't give permits doesn't count. It's unlawful. It's forcible transfer. It's an inhumane act. The last two I'll say very briefly, one is the denial of residency and legal nationality to Palestinians, including in the occupied territory, who some of whom weren't there when the occupation began or, or were abroad for too long in the first early years of the occupation, the first 30 years of the occupation, and lost their legal right to live in the place that they're from. I mentioned the refugees from 1948 as well. And finally, finally, um, the denial of basic civil rights to Palestinians in the occupied territory, right? So Palestinians have lived under draconian military law for 57 years. This gathering, we were meeting like this in Ramallah, more than 10 people without a permit from the army would be grounds for a 10 year jail sentence under Israeli military law. Being a member of an unlawful association, which they've applied to human rights organizations, political organizations, virtually every major political movement would be unlawful and grounds as well for a prolonged jail sentence. I spent a lot of time on apartheid, but the reason I wanted to sit, do that, getting back to like the thrust of our talk, is on October 6th, Palestinians were victims of war crimes and crimes against humanity. So let's talk about October 7th and the last six months. I want to start by saying that on October 7th, uh, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and Palestinian armed groups carried out attacks in southern Israel. Those attacks included the commission of war crimes. The deliberate killing of civilians, the taking of civilians hostages, these are war crimes that have no justification. Nothing can justify directly targeting civilians, nothing can justify taking civilians as hostages. At the same time, nothing can justify what the Israeli government has done in response. They immediately cut basic services, electricity, water, food, fuel to Gaza. That is textbook collective punishment. That is a war crime under international law, punishing the entire civilian population for the acts of some individuals on October 7th. The Israeli government has also obstructed the entry of aid. They've been doing so for six months. That is a war crime. You're allowed as the, you know, the occupier to monitor, but not to uh, obstruct the entry of aid. The Israeli government, as Human Rights Watch has documented, has also used starvation as a weapon of war, right? They've weaponized food. It's not just the blocking of aid. It's not just the sealing of their crossings. It's not just the blocking of services. They've also apparently destroyed, as we've documented with satellite imagery, agricultural lands in Gaza. They've also destroyed objects necessary for human survival, apparently deliberately, water infrastructure, bakeries, wheat mills, etc. All of this amounts to the war crime of starvation um, as a weapon of war. In addition, of course, we have the airstrikes. Um, human Rights Watch and other human rights groups have documented unlawful airstrikes. The Israeli government has struck hospitals, schools, UN facilities, you name it. Um, they've used heavy-duty bombs in one of the most densely populated areas on Earth, an open-air prison. Um, even though 83 countries, including this country, have signed a declaration not to use heavy-duty bombs and heavy artillery in densely populated areas, They've unlawfully used white phosphorus in densely populated Gaza, as we've documented. The Israeli government has turned entire large parts of, of Gaza into rubble. They've destroyed the majority of homes, of universities, of uh, hospitals, of schools. Name it, the majority of it has been destroyed. And again, I think I, I know you all know the facts, so I won't spend too much time going into it. In addition, the majority of Gaza's population has been displaced many multiple times over. These evacuation orders issued by the Israeli government are unlawful because there's no safe place to go in Gaza and no reliably secure way to get anywhere. There is increasing evidence that the Israeli government is making large parts of Gaza, northern Gaza included, unlivable. Forcible displacement is a war crime under international law. The situation isn't just limited to Gaza, right? In the West Bank, my colleagues stood up in Geneva and the Human Rights Council on October 3rd and said we're seeing unprecedented violence against Palestinians in the West Bank. That has gotten multiple times worse in the West Bank. More Palestinians were killed between October 7th and the end of December 2023 than in any year since the UN began systematically recording fatalities of Palestinians. 
We've seen settler violence against Palestinians, which let's be clear, settler violence is state violence. It occurs because the state turns a blind eye and sometimes worse to it, there's impunity for it, has reached record years long highs. More Palestinians are being held in administrative detention without trial or charge today than at any point in 30 years. Name the metric and I can show you that we're at a years long high in, in, in that situation. So I wanna to move to the second part of my talk by sort of taking a step back and talking about international courts in Palestine. We've laid out the human rights situation very much in depth, right? The apartheid, the occupation, the denial of the returns of refugees, the current atrocities. So what does it mean for international courts? We hear of action at the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice. Let me just say we're at a unique moment for four reasons when it comes to courts and policy. The first is what I just spent the first 20 minutes of my, 25 minutes of my talk talking about, which is the unprecedented repression on the ground. But the second reason why we're in a unique moment is because of what's happened in Russia and Ukraine, where we've seen the West rally around the rules-based international order. That's the term they've used. Let's defend international law. Let's defend international courts. Let's ensure accountability for grave abuses. Um, the, <clears throat> we've seen an unprecedented funding for the International Criminal Court, the right to defend yourself against occupy. All these principles have been bandied about, rightfully so, by Western countries. So, we've, so, so we see four, these four trends, one being the unprecedented atrocity, the second being the defense of the rules-based international order. The third, and I'll get to this when I, when I conclude more, is the consensus around Israel, Israel's apartheid or oppression of Palestinians. And I'll get to this more later in the talk, but there has been this moment, especially in the global South, and we see it with the proceedings, of recognition of the reality of grave abuse of Palestinians. And the fourth trend is these unique proceedings that we see at the International Criminal Court and Court of Justice. These were not in place during the previous rounds of hostilities. The ICC, and we'll talk about in a second, the formal probe only began in 2021. <clears throat> the ICJ genocide case only started the very end of December of this year. The advisory opinion was requested December of 2022. We're gonna get into each of them, but these are all new proceedings. So you put together the unprecedented abuse, the consensus around apartheid, the unique proceedings, and the, um, uh, the uh, 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 situation on the ground, the consensus, and you have a very unique moment. So let me spend a few minutes and then we'll, we'll move towards the Q&A on each of the proceedings, just so we're all on the same page with what's happening and what might come. Let me start with the genocide case at the International Court of Justice. For the non-lawyers in the room, <clears throat> the International Court of Justice is hearing an interstate disputes between um, South Africa and Israel. South Africa alleges that Israel violated the Genocide Convention. Both South Africa and Israel are signatory to the Genocide Convention. In the International Court of Justice, the, the world's highest court, the UN's highest court, is the place you go when two states have disputes about their obligations under different treaties. So South Africa looks at many things I talked about in my presentation, the killings in Gaza, the destruction of infrastructure, the displacement, the starvation, uh, they cite human rights watch the reporting on starvation, the deprivation of medical care, the humanitarian situation, to allege that Israel's committing genocide and um, uh, violation of the Genocide Convention against Palestinians. Um, let me be clear, this is not a criminal case. The International Court of Justice is not a criminal court. So this is about state responsibility for violations under a particular treaty. So what, what happened in the case? So in December, South Africa files the case, end of December. Israel then moves to dismiss the case, basically to say, there's no dispute here, there's no jurisdiction, these are crazy claims, etc. South Africa also uh, requested that the court issue provisional measures. Provisional measures are the equivalent, in essence, of an injunction in a U.S. court. So they asked for steps to be taken to safeguard the rights of the affected party while the court weighs the case on the merits. On January 26th, um, the court issued uh, a ruling. They, the ruling had several very important elements. The first thing is 
that they confirmed that there is jurisdiction, there is a dispute here. They threw out the Israeli government's attempts to throw out the case. They basically, uh, they basically said that there is uh, a legitimate claim here. And the key part of their ruling is that they had to find the underlying claims on the merits to be plausible, that there were plausible violations of the, Gen of the Genocide Convention. It's again, like an injunction. If you go to court, ask for an injunction, and you have no case, the court's not gonna issue the measures. Like that, the court can only issue these provisional measures if they believe that the claims are plausible. So the court found that it was plausible that the Israeli government is committing violations of the Genocide Convention. They then issued six binding provisional measures. These are orders that the Israeli government, legally binding orders on the Israeli government. One, they ordered the Israeli government not to commit genocide. Second, they said the Israeli government must prevent the commission of genocide. Third, they said the Israeli government must um, combat incitement to genocide. Fourth, they said the Israeli government must ensure uh, humanitarian aid and basic services are provided to the Palestinians of Gaza. Fifth, they said that evidence must be preserved so the case can be heard on the merits. And six, they ordered the Israeli government to report back on their compliance with these measures within 30 days. <clears throat> this was a, this ruling was virtually unanimous. It was, so the court, judge, the ICJ has 15 judges, plus the parties each get to appoint a judge. So there's 15 judges plus an Israeli and a uh, South African judge. Most of the measures were, they were all 15 to two or 16 to one, with the Israeli judge being the minority on some of the cases and one of the other judges as well. Um, so this was an overarching um, uh, ruling in favor and momentous case and a, and a ruling highlighting the gravity of the situation on the ground. The 30 day mark for Israel to comply was this Monday. Human Rights Watch released a report on Monday saying that the Israeli government is not complying with the International Court of Justice's order. Other human rights groups, Amnesty and others, have issued similar findings. We focused on the aid. <clears throat> the number of trucks going into Gaza has gone down from the three weeks before the ruling and the, and the three weeks after. Uh, less aid is getting to northern Gaza. Um, you know, starvation is getting worse. There have been bombings of aid convoys. We can go on and on and on. So Israel submitted its report. Its report was not public. The court did not order it to be public. South Africa is now has a chance to respond. And the court has the option to issue additional measures. They could not issue additional measures. They could um, issue a report. They may not. Um, but there's two parallel tracks that we're going on right now with the genocide case. One is the implementation of the provisional measures. And two is the hearing on the merits. The hearing on the merits will take years. Gambia brought a case of genocide against Myanmar for the treatment of Rohingya in 2019. That case is ongoing. <clears throat> the provisional measures, though, there is this reporting mechanism on them. Let me be clear that in some ways, the court's ruling on the provisional measures even went beyond what the court ordered when it came to Bosnia and the Bosnian genocide, right? Because if you guys remember, in 93, 1993, the court had a request for provisional measures. The provisional measures were issued in 1995 via Trebrenica. So this court in some ways went even further in this particular case. Um, there's a lot more we could say about the case, but I'm, I wanna move on and, and wrap up with the last two proceedings. There's a second thing happening at the International Court of Justice, which is also momentous, but got significantly less attention which is the International Court of Justice has been asked to issue an advisory opinion on the consequences of Israel's prolonged occupation. The UN General Assembly requested this in 2000, December of 2022. Um, and it was the first, it's only the second time ever they've been asked to get at, issue an advisory opinion on Israel-Palestine. The first one was about, as I said earlier, on the wall on the separation barrier. That was issued in 2004. But this case goes much further because the question is much broader in its framing. What are, what's the legal status and what are the consequences of Israel's prolonged occupation? In July, 57 states made submission and interstate organizations made submissions, which are really important because states are kind of like parties in the court. So their submissions have a lot of weight. In October, states had follow-up briefs. And this past week, and only wrapped up on Monday, 
<clears throat> you had a number of states, I, I can't remember, I think it was 52 states um, and three interstate organizations made uh, presentations, oral arguments to the court about the underlying uh, abuses in the case. The vast majority of them highlighted Israel's abuses and the importance of respect and integrity for international law. Let me take a minute to explain to you three or four substantive issues that the court could rule on and why it matters. The first substantive issue the court could rule on is the legality of the occupation itself, right? And again, for those of you, we could nerd out about whether or not occupations, the lawyers and human rights lawyers learn, whether or not an occupation can be actually determined to be legal or not. It's subject of some debate in the field. But let me just say there are several arguments that have been put forward, right? The first is that Israel's um, occupation of 1967 was an illegal use of force that it didn't comply with the UN Charter regarding when you can engage in uh, force against another state, which is you know, basically in self-defense. Um, <clears throat> some say it was never legal, even in 67. Some say maybe it was legal then, but a 57-year occupation is neither a proportionate or a um, necessary condition of self-defense. Others will say Israel is annexed the West Bank either the de jure in the case of Jerusalem or de facto in, 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 in the case of the rest of the West Bank, and that annexation is unlawful, right? And some people say de facto, we can say it's de facto annexed based on the duration of the occupation, statements by Israeli officials saying they intend to rule in perpetuity, um, the language used, etc. Annexation is a violation of international law. You can't annex occupied territory. Some argue that the occupation is illegal because you're violating the right of self-determination of the Palestinian people, and therefore the occupation is illegal. Because remember, an occupation is supposed to be about preserving the status quo, freezing things in place so the indigenous community can take the rules. There's also the argument that the occupation is going to become an illegal occupant. Because of the, uh, they're, they're supposed to be a trustee on the land, they're not, the duration, the systematic abuse. So the court could very well rule that the occupation is illegal. Secondly, the court may rule, the International Court of Justice, about the violations that the Israeli government has committed. Settlements being a violation of a war crime, forcible transfer. The court could also weigh in on the balance between human rights and humanitarian law. Again, I don't want to nerd out too much you know, here, but there's a term that human rights lawyers know called the lex specialis. Right, which basically means when multiple bodies of law apply, how do you determine which one uh, gets more weight? Again, let me give you one example, right? Uh, administrative detention, detention without trial or charge. It's allowed as a temporary exceptional measure under international humanitarian law, but human rights law doesn't have the same provision, right? So, I mean, let's be clear. Israel's use of administration is neither temporary nor exceptional. 4,000 nearly Palestinians being held without trial or charge in year 57 of the occupation. But putting aside Israel's unlawful use of administrative detention, if the court decides and Human Rights Watch has determined that human rights law should apply fully, as well as the protections of international humanitarian law, that could have consequences for how states and institutions interpret the balance between human rights and humanitarian law. Third, the court could rule on apartheid or on persecution or on racial discrimination. <clears throat> I posted a Twitter thread on Monday where I noted that um, 26 states and three interstate organizations made statements, referenced apartheid in their oral hearings or in their um, written, uh, presentations, plus the African Union, the Organization of uh, Islamic Cooperation, as well as the African, African Union Arab League and Organization. They represent 90 countries, right? So they, these plus 26 states themselves mentioned apartheid, which is really, really significant. And the court, again, it's not a criminal court, but it could issue guidance on the law or it could reach findings around apartheid. And finally, the court could reach a ruling around consequences, right? Because the court was asked, what are the consequences for Israel, for the UN and for other states? So what are some things the court could rule on? There's a prohibition under international law to recognize something illegal as legal, right? You can't recognize illegality as legal. So there could be calls for individual or collective action around Israel's illegal activity. Secondly, there's a duty not to aid and assist 
in the commission of abuses or unlawful acts. So again, there could be guidance there issued to, well, what does that mean? There could be rulings about trade, cooperation, arms, sanctions, accountability, security council action. And finally, there's an obligation to cooperate to end abuse and, and illegality, right? I wanted to spend a lot of time on this decision because it doesn't get as much discussion, but to me, it's really, really significant. Why is it significant? Let me be clear. Advisor opinions are not binding. It's not like the genocide case. It's not binding, but, but it has significant authority. Let me give you an example. Do people know that the BDS movement, the Boycott Divestment Sanction Movement, was launched on the one-year anniversary of the last advisor opinion issued by the International Court of Justice? So even if it doesn't legally have major consequences, as a tool of movements and activism, it's significant. So the key questions will be, how broadly does the court interpret the questions? Does it issue guidance on law? Does it take stock of the reality on the court? So the final thing I really, uh, not quite final, but near final thing I want to talk about is the international criminal, which is the other big thing in the room, right? So again, a bit of 101 for the non-lawyers in the room. The international criminal court is a criminal. It has jurisdiction, basically, and I'm simplifying things, two ways, more or less. If the Security Council refers, a situation, or if states accede to their own statute. So in the case of Palestine, on January 2nd, 2015, the state of Palestine acceded to the Rome statute. They accepted the court's jurisdiction going back six months. <clears throat> that triggered the opening of a preliminary inquiry by the court, which lasted almost five years. In December of 2019, the former prosecutor, Fatou bin Souda, said there was a reasonable basis to open a formal investigation into serious crimes committed in Palestine, but she asked for the court to confirm that it had jurisdiction. Because some people said, well, Palestine's not really a state. Can they accede to the Rome Statute? Is there a jurisdiction? So the court then spent about a year studying that question. And in a 2-1 decision, the court upheld that, at least for these purposes, it has jurisdiction over Palestine. That can be appealed later on. And then the prosecutor, Ben Suda, opened a formal investigation. And here we are almost three years later in the formal investigation. Kareem, uh, Kareem Khan, the new prosecutor, well, not new anymore, but um, compared to Ben Suda, <clears throat> has the ability today to issue indictments for individuals, Israelis, Palestinians, who commit serious crimes. He visited Israel and the occupied territory at the end of the year. He also went to Rafah, the, closing, the crossing, and basically made clear that these events fall within the jurisdiction of the court, that they're following events, that this is an important investigation, and that he's following what's transpiring. So where, where might this go in the future? Okay, And I'm going to leave you with, uh, on this issue, a set of challenges that might for the road ahead. One, there are legal challenges. I'll just give you one example of a legal challenge. Um, and there are many. Not that they're insurmountable, but Settlements. So I told you the court has jurisdiction uh, from the middle of 2014 till now. Well, what about the settlements that were built in the 1970s and 80s and 90s and 2000s? Are those continuing crimes? Or can we only look at settlements built since uh, mid-20? Don't worry, many settlements have been built since 2014 or settlement units. But that's one legal question the court has to sort out. Secondly, there are factual questions. There are factual questions. Let me give you an example. Um, uh, and again, I keep saying that I don't want to nerd out on, on international law, but to make a deter like the God, because most of the investigation is focused on settlements and, and, and the hostilities in Gaza. But to find a stri airstrike is unlawful. You can't just have a general statement. You have to determine a strike is mainly disproportionate or indiscriminate. But that's a very fact specific inquiry because you have to assess the military gain, the civilian casualties, who fired the strike, um, you know, was there a military target? How are we going to do that? Much less about what's happened the last six months where there's very little information actually on each strike coming up. But imagine 2021 and 20, all the other rounds of hostilities. There are, and, and the ICC hasn't had access to Gaza to investigate. Third, there are still jurisdictional issues. Okay, The court has to find that the principle of complementarity has been met. Again, for the non-lawyers in the room, that means the ICC has to be a court of last resort. They only take cases if they determine that the local courts are unwilling or unable to investigate this. Now, for Human Rights Watch, it's a slam dunk. There's a whitewash when it comes to Israeli 
and Palestinian investigations of serious crimes, and therefore the ICC needs jurisdiction. But this prosecutor set a very low bar when it came to the UK investigating its own abuses in Iraq, and basically said, well, you know, there's kind of courts, and they, you know, they looked at one or two things. So will the court set a very low bar here? It's a real question. And the final obstacle, which is maybe the biggest obstacle, is the political pressures that are there. There are political dynamics around the election of this prosecutor. Will the prosecutor try and make a political decision? Let me indict one Israeli and one Palestinian. We've seen a precedent for it. In Afghanistan, this prosecutor, his jurisdiction was to look at all crimes in, in Afghanistan, but he issued a statement saying, I'm only looking at the Taliban. I'm not looking at crimes committed by uh, Western powers, basically. Is there a risk of a political decision? So there's a lot at stake, but there's also a lot of challenges. So really where I want to wrap up, I don't know how I'm doing that time, Benny, but- You're doing pretty good, actually. Okay. okay. <laughs> so where I really want to sort of wrap up my presentation is like, what does this all mean? Like, where do we go? What are we asking for, et cetera? So obviously as a human rights organization, our you know, primary focus is civilian, civilian protection, saving lives. So when we're doing meetings with governments, which we're doing all the time, we are saying, let aid in, you know, stop unlawful attacks, release those unlawfully detained, whether they're Israeli hostages, civilians held hostage in Gaza, or Palestinians unlawfully held in Israel. So our number one you know, ask is always about civilian uh, protection. But at the same time, we also try and acknowledge everything I've talked about for the last 45 minutes, right? One, you must recognize reality for what it is. We must address the root causes, right? Which is serial impunity, Israel's apartheid against Palestinians. And it starts with basic truths, right? A 57-year occupation is not temporary. Denying Palestinians their fundamental rights solely because of who they are, solely because they're Palestinian and not Jewish, is not simply a matter of an abusive occupation or an occupation gone wild. Third, a 30-plus year peace process will not on its own systematically dismantle a structure of repression. Fourth, democracy, as my good friend Guy Ahad, the former executive director of the Israeli human rights group at Salem puts it, democracy is the rule of the people, not the rule of one people over another. Fifth, a system methodically engineered to maintain the domination of one people uh, over another, a single system, a daily reality of structural violence and repression is not a conflict between two equal parties, right? We have to start with acknowledging these basic truths and recognizing um, the reality for it. Apartheid is not a hypothetical future scenario. It's a lived reality for Palestinians. Palestinians have been saying that for a long time. We have to start with acknowledging these truths. Secondly, or, or thirdly, there must be accountability for all, and again, I'm not going to delay the point because we've talked about it at length, but there must be accountability. Perpetrators must be held to account. I can tell you, I've been to the prisons, I've been to spent many visits to Guantanamo, I've been to Egypt post-military coup, I've spent time in Palestine, I've been kicked out of four countries. I can tell you this as a fact. When there is no accountability for abuses, the abuses will repeat and become even worse. It's a universal truth everywhere in the world. And finally, there must be an end to complicity in serious abuses. And that includes ending, imposing an arms embargo on the Israeli government, evaluating complicity in all its forms, including the complicity of universities, including the complicity that we each face. We're Americans, uh, many of us, or most of us, uh, living in a country that is deeply complicit in these abuses. And so we have to start with evaluating that. And this brings me to really, really, really my last point, which is coming back to Rutgers and Newark, um, and all of you. And I've understood and heard a little bit about the climate on campus and some of the um, challenges that you have faced for speaking out. And what I want to tell you all is something, um, you know, as somebody who comes from being a student and, and someone who sees the world, I spend every day talking to governments, including the U.S., Germany, the U.K., about apartheid, about the genocide case, about these issues. If I can do that as a human rights organization with the strongest governments who are Israel's allies, you should be able to do that on a campus like Rutgers. Um, and you're very lucky to have the student groups you have. You're very lucky to have the center here and, and, and some of the professors you have on faculty that are teaching these subjects. But I want you to know the reason why we see the crackdowns happening on college campuses is because the supporters of apartheid, the supporters of the Israeli government know they've lost the argument. 
When I was a student 20 years ago, there would be a debate, they would challenge, they would, they would make their own arguments, but there really is no debate over where is, whether Israel is committing apartheid, over the nature of some of these abuses. So the last tool you have in the toolkit is to try and shut down the debate. But the more of us that stick out their necks, the harder it is to cut it off. So I just want you to know that you may feel lonely, you may feel difficult, uh, but there is a growing movement. There is human rights advocates that do this every day. Obviously, it's different for us. You know, we have jobs and we have, you know, you guys are still starting many of your careers and your professions. But I want you to know the value and the importance of what you're doing, the events you're organizing, the conversations you're having, they are changing things. As dark as things are on the ground today, um, you know, there is an opportunity to change that reality. So I just wanted to sort of end by saying the work you're doing, speaking out is really, really important. Keep it up and, uh, and we stand with you. Thank you.